Hello and welcome to Unusual Careers, where we explore the variety of careers in science, technology, engineering, arts, and math, also called STEAM, at the Smithsonian's National Zoo and Conservation Biology Institute. My name is Shelly, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'll be your host for today. Today, I am so excited to continue the Smithsonian's celebration of Black Birders Week, started by the Black AF and STEM Collective. This week is dedicated to highlighting Black nature enthusiasts and increasing the visibility of Black birders who face unique challenges and often find themselves not welcomed or excluded from outdoor spaces. As a white woman in the zoo field, I recognize that I do not face the same challenges and hurdles that many of my peers may face. My experience in the outdoors is different, which is why I'm excited to bring this program to you so that you can learn together and make, so that we can learn together and we can make space for black voices and stories to be heard. Before we meet our guests for today, you're gonna see two polls pop up on your screen. The first, what is your favorite bird related activity? You can select all that apply. Maybe it's bird watching, putting out clean bird feeders, reading about different bird species, submitting your bird findings to eBird, or caring for pet birds. Second, which of the following subjects do you think a bird keeper uses in their career? Science, technology, engineering, art, or math? While you take some time to answer that poll, I'm gonna go over the format of our program today. This webinar is live captioned, you want to locate that CC button at the bottom of your screen for those to appear. You'll also notice this program is being interpreted in American Sign Language. This feature is best viewed from a desktop computer rather than tablet or phone. If you're having trouble with either service, please chat us so we can assist you. Remember, this is a webinar, so we cannot see or hear you. However, we encourage you to engage with us in a number of ways. You already saw that we'll be launching polls throughout the program. And additionally, you'll see that the Q&A is also open. If you hit that Q&A button at any time, you can ask questions of our guests, try to keep your questions on topic, and you can always check under the My Questions column to see if an educator has already answered your question. Uh, today's program will be about 45 minutes total with an additional 15 minutes at the end for our live Q&A where we will ask as many and answer as many questions as time will allow. Educators, if you are streaming for your whole class, be sure to keep your keyboard close by to chime in on their behalf. We also now have emoji reactions, which so many of you have already found. So if you are a big lover, a big fan of birds, send me a big thumbs up if you are so excited for our program today and you love birds. Yeah, so many thumbs up. And lastly, you will also see that the chat is open for you to message us or to answer any questions that I might have of you. So now I want you to find that chat and tell me where you are joining from. I wanna see who has flown in from the farthest away. Let's see, we already had welcome Miss Blockland's class from Springfield, Massachusetts. Let's see, we had Fluvana Middle School, two classrooms joining today, welcome. Let's see, we had Benjamin from Virginia, Isabel from California, Talia from Virginia, Daniel from Portland, Oregon, more from California. We have someone joining us all the way from Derby in England. So we are officially international for this program. Welcome Miss Lindbergh's class from Fairfax, Virginia. McMinnville, Oregon. Jefferson City, Missouri. Someone joining from Philadelphia, others from Fairfax. Miss Pearson's ELA class sixth grade in Arlington, Virginia. Saratoga Springs, New York. We have folks from all over Albuquerque, Pearl River High School, welcome. Welcome Mr. Stewart's class from Triangle, amazing. All right, I do wanna quickly introduce you to my team helping behind the scenes. Today we have Erica, Caden, Alexis, and Laura also answering your questions. 
And we even have a very special guest joining. We have our special chat expert, Sarah Halliger, who is the curator of the birdhouse here at the Smithsonian's National Zoo and Conservation Biology Institute. Um, so we are so excited for her to be joining. So you might see some answers to your questions from her as well. All right. Again, we have so many people joining us. We have someone who's from Nepal, but is currently in America, Sadie from Fairfax, Miss Nguyen's class. All right, let's get started, everyone. Once again, welcome to Unusual Careers. I am so excited to welcome our guest and my friend, Miss Gwen Cooper. Hi, Gwen, and welcome to Unusual Careers. A little slow on the tapping, but I am okay. I am here, and hello, everyone. Hello, um, Gwen. Why don't you start by telling us what your title is here at the zoo? Uh, my title is senior keeper at the National Zoo Birdhouse. Senior keeper. All right, that makes me. That gives me the impression that you have a lot of experience as a birdhouse keeper, a zookeeper. How long have you worked here at the zoo? So I came to National Zoo in 91, got hired as a keeper in 93. I'm going on 30 years as far as being a paid keeper. So, wow. kind of, so senior not only means longevity, but it's my age. <laughs> no, we won't have that. 30 go. years is a really, really long time. Have you always worked with the birds in those 29, 30 years? So I volunteered at birds and small mammals as part of a program that I was in. And I was just coming to work, having fun, working with animals, didn't even realize it was a job. Learned a lot, had a lot of fun, and I'm still here. So that tells you a lot. That's fantastic. Gwen, we've featured so many amazing careers um, on this series, but you are our first zookeeper that we have featured. And I wanna know a little bit more about what goes into um, being a zookeeper. Um, but before I have you give the answer, I'm going to launch another poll already for our audience. Okay. Um, let's see what they think. Which of the following things are things that zookeepers are responsible for? Potentially animal welfare, training, cleaning, feeding, encouraging breeding, maybe caring for chicks. So I'm going to give our audience just a couple seconds on that poll and let's see if okay. they can put on their zookeeper hats and see what this career is all about. Just going to check to see if we have any other international viewers today. All right, I'm going to give folks another few seconds on that poll. Okay. Closing it in three, two, one. All right, I'll share these results. Let's, it looks like folks guessed everything. Our first, our top two guesses were feeding and caring for chicks. Gwen, what goes into being a zookeeper? So all of those things. Plus, I guess I would start with first having a love of animals. That always helps. That pretty much is the reason most of us got into the field or did some kind of capacity in the field. I um, loved animals from the time I was very little. You know, you always thought you was that weird kid that wanted to be with animals instead of people. Then come to find I had got it kind of inherited from my dad. And that's like you can communicate with animals. I mean, first you get the, oh, they're cute or they're interesting or they're just fun. And you always want to take care of them. You always want to love them. So I found out I'm not alone in that field. Obviously there's more zookeepers than myself, but it's just something that I love to do. Didn't even think it could be a job that they pay you for. Yeah. Yeah. So we mentioned this word animal welfare. What mm -hmm. is animal welfare? Can you give us a little breakdown of the things that kind of go into that, that you need to be um, cognizant of with your um, collection of animals you care for? Yeah. So with all the love, caring, all the things that you want to do for animals, there's still people that's fighting them for, for them welfare-wise. Yeah. We have a committee. We have people that make sure that we're doing, because you love them, that still doesn't mean you're doing everything right. And we're always learning. We want to kind of evolve into making animals live longer, 
be happy or look like they're in national exhibit. So the welfare committee looks out for us and the animals. We don't know it all. So you have to have somebody to make sure that those animals, are, all their needs are met. So that helps to have a committee to help us get those things done. That's great. And so some of these other things were like cleaning and feeding that all animals need to be fed and all animals need to have a clean space. Can you tell us a little bit more about what goes into that? Yeah, it's like when people hear you a zookeeper, I don't think so, so much now, but back in the day, it was like, oh, you just clean up poop. Yeah, you clean up poop, but it's so much more. Yeah. You have to be aware of how the exhibit looks from the public's point of view, it's which you learn as a zookeeper. You can go in the back door and you see poop that you get, but you also want to live the the public's experience of zookeeping. So yeah, you clean, you clean up poop, you pick up feathers, you pick up debris, you pick up things that may end up in exhibits from you know outside sources. We're not going to go into that, but it's all about the animals. So it's more than cleaning and for us to hear is cleaning poop. It's what we do, it's what we like. And that is a small portion of what zookeepers do. And I always like to mention that poop is also so yeah. important. Poop tells us so much information about the, the health and well being of our animals that yes. the poop portion, while a lot of it is cleaning, it tells us so much. And from these pictures here, you as an animal keeper participate in the veterinary care, the health management of these animals too. What is your role in caring for? the medical side of these animals. So you come to work, you're prepared to pick up poop and all the other things we talked about. You're also the one that can notice when an animal's not well. You, you know that animal like you know the back of your hand or you try to. I'm still improving on that method. It's like, I can go and I know if my bird's off, I look for, first you look for injuries. Injuries are obvious, but there's other things that you may know that not even your curator may know. And I go to my curator and say, hey, this looks a little off, this looks a little loof. And she takes your word for it. And we call in the vets, you have to assist with that exam. You have to, like I'm doing there, holding that bird, assisting, because we probably can hold insecure the birds better than some other people. Yeah, we're yeah. gonna put our own horn with that. So you have to assist with it. And it's part of the things that you do as a zookeeper, you want to, you wanna see that animal get care and get better. Yes, and we had such great comments in the chat. Miss Pearson's class said it's so similar to taking care of your pet. Some people might not like or get grossed out by picking up after their dog or cat, but it's all part of making sure they have a good well-being and taking care. And they have tons of pet lovers in their class. That's so great. Yeah. Um, so another example of one of those sort of daily or weekly tasks you do is weighing the animals. Tell us about weighing the animals. Why is it important and how do you do it? So like with most things, one of the first things that you can keep on track of for an animal's health, especially a young chick like that, is weight. You like to see a weight gain going up. So if that animal can't come to me and say, hey, Gwen, I'm not feeling well, check my weight. We do it anyway. We check the weight. It's the first indication of something going on. Like this here is a Corey getting the weight on a scale. And it's something you want to do either monthly or weekly. Because if they can't tell you my tummy hurts or something's wrong, yeah, we can at least get a weight and that's the first sign that something may be awry. So that's so cool. So this is a Cory Buster getting on a scale. Is that right? Yes. Getting and, on a scale. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, why does it have the hay on it? So it doesn't know that it's a scale to kind of camouflage it, or what is the reason for the hay? So it helps. It's not like when you go home and you walk in your bathroom, you know your bathroom scale. These scales do not live in the ex exhibit all the time. So we want to introduce something new. We want to make it look as natural and not as scary. And then, of course, you put hay or copper down to help with traction. But it's more or less, oh, I can't walk in here with this big scale and expect this bird just to step on it. You have to make it look a little friendlier. So you use treats and you camouflage the big metal scale to make it look a little nicer and happier. <laughs> Yeah, a little less scary. So it's yeah. not this big, shiny metal thing in the bird's you know, home habitat. That's really neat. And so another aspect of animal care that we had in the poll was training. Can you talk to us a little bit about training? When I think of training, I think of making my dog sit down or roll over. Is this the same sort of training that you're doing? So obviously years ago when there wasn't a lot of training like zoos do now. It helps. It helps to 
make, say, an exam or getting a weight or just getting a good look at an animal. If you do some training, like here in this photo with the cassowary, this is not a bird that we can go in with and say, hey, I need to get a blood draw. I need you to get a weight. So this is a cold red bird, which means this is a, a bird that can hurt you, which nobody wants to get hurt. You are the bird. Yeah. So my coworker here is giving this bird a training lesson to step into this crate. Ideally, we would want to get weights and we would like to get a blood draw. Blood draws from birds are really hard to do. And we can't go in here and touch this bird. This is, she's not going to let us. She's cute and we love her, but she can hurt you. Yeah. So if she comes in this box for her treat and presents her wing through another opening in the crate, ideally, we would like to get the blood drawn without it being too stressful for her and also safe for us. So training's key in zookeeping. I want to back up a little bit. You talked about that this cassowary is such a large, potentially dangerous bird that you don't actually share the same space no. as the bird. Um, I think a lot of people probably think of most of the birds we have are small, maybe songbirds like our orioles and wood thrush and things like that. But these are large birds that can still hurt us potentially. Yes. And is, is cassowary the only bird that we have like that? So our cassowary is our most dangerous bird that we have at the birdhouse. This is a juvenile one. He's still in the brown colors of being young. But even at this age, we do not want to go in hands-on because cassowaries deserve a lot of respect. They can't hurt you. So we do, training would be key to never have to be in the same yard with it. Shifting around, everybody's happy, and we get accomplish the goals that we like. So. Absolutely. What makes cassowaries so dangerous compared to the other birds? So in this picture, you really can't see the feet. They have a middle toe that's pretty gnarly and wicked looking. It has a really long toenail on it. It would do the damage. And I mean, they could kick you really strong. So a lot of respect for cassowaries. Even though they look cute right here, this will grow up to be a very dangerous and very well-respected bird. <laughs> That's great. Um, Diane had asked, how big do cassowaries get? So females are normally bigger. Our males, we get weights on them again. We use scale to get weights so we can track growth and health of animals. So the ones we have now, our males are like 41 kilograms. So pretty big, four or five feet tall, pretty heavy. This is a nice size bird. Yeah. That is quite a, a, a large, dangerous bird. That's great. Yeah. So we've talked a little bit about some of the tasks that you're responsible for as a keeper, the cleaning, the feeding, the training, which is a little bit more difficult for a, a bird like this that you can't go in with. Yeah. Is every day the same for you? You you following that same schedule of tasks, feeding, training, weighing, et cetera? Well, one of the other wonderful things about being a zookeeper, no day is the same. You come to work expecting it to be the same. You want your animals to still be up, be healthy, be ready to eat. But our day can go left with the blink of an eye. Yeah. We never expect our day to be the same. Would be ideal, but I think that's one of the things we like. We have to be prepared for our day to take a turn and jump in and be ready to do the same job that we do every day. Just different. Yeah. Just different, the flexibility. And I think that's a very common theme that we've heard on this program. Working in a zoo, even if you're not a zookeeper, there's still no two days are the same because yeah. all of us, regardless of our job, are working around the schedules often of our live collection that can't actually talk to us. So we have to interpret their needs and go um, work for them, right? Yes. Here's another great example of a big important part of the zoo field is enrichment. Can you tell us a little bit about what enrichment is and how you provide enrichment for birds? So again, I'm going to probably go back to reference the zoos of old because I've been coming to the zoo since I was very, very little. My dad loved the zoo. We lived in the zoo on weekends and I loved it. So knowing what I know now, Versus what I knew then about zoos, just coming to the zoo and seeing animals, you got excited. You see animals that you love to see. Yeah. But as a kid and not realizing that these animals were just were on, were on exhibit, didn't look really healthy, didn't have the exhibit that looked nice. But you saw, I just wanted to see a hyena. I always wanted to see a hyena as a kid. And they were literally in cages that looked kind of barbaric and barren and hyenas didn't laugh for us no matter what we did. 
and now knowing what I know now about enrichment and healthier animals and they live in longer, you have to give them things that would enrich their lives. You have to make them being on exhibit to be healthy. They're not there to see the public like the public's there to see them. Yeah. So we need to do things to make them happier and make the exhibits look more like natural habitat, things to play with puzzles to figure out. You just have to give them things to enjoy like anybody else that would want to enjoy. You don't want to come to work and be living in a exhibit with no grass, no toys. Enrichment helps. Enriching animals is key to good zookeeping. Yeah. So anything that's going to exercise the animal's brain mentally, their body physically. I always tell people like, I like to play Sudoku or do crossword puzzles. <laughs> so enrichment is like a crossword puzzle for an animal. It exercises their brains. Yes. Um, that's awesome. And we had a really great question from Emily in the chat. Again, we talked about these different types of birds. Some you go in with, some you don't. Do you use different strategies for training the different birds? Yes. Like the cassowary versus, say, another rat type, rheas. Rheas we can go in with. We don't have to worry about rheas. I mean, they could pinch you. They have little cute mouth like that. You can pinch. Yeah, that's going to hurt. <laughs> but there's no fear of this particular bird harming me to the point of something tragic. Yeah. So we can approach them differently. And they're very, very food motivated, like a lot of birds are. So... With rheas, we try to get them to move for food or any other items that keep them interested. And we can go in the yard with them. It does help to go in, but we cannot do that with all birds. Right. So we try to do things that they enjoy doing. Yeah. Food is a big motivator. <laughs> and enrichment items. That's great. This photo just makes me laugh. It looked like the bird was laughing around <laughs> with you all. <laughs> they love to eat snow. Rheas love to eat snow. Oh, really? Snow. That's oh, such yeah. a fun fact. I had no idea. Um, so we, we make a path and they help by helping eat it. So. They shovel the snow for you. A little slower, but they will eat a path to face it. They love it. Um, I love that. Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about the birdhouse as a whole? How many birds do you have there? How many species do you have there? Has it always housed the same species? Well, some of the species we have when I started, but back in the early 90s, it was so much bigger, so much bigger. We had definitely bigger waterfowl collection. We had bigger bird of prey collection. We just had so many birds. We had pelicans. We had, it was huge. They were a little smaller now. Um, I couldn't tell you exactly how many we have total, but we have rheas, flamingos. We have cranes. We have quarries. We have an, a bunch of new passerines coming in. It's going to be a part of the new birdhouse. And that's going to be an amazing story to tell. And hopefully, can you, we have, can you tell us what a passerine is? So, passerines are a little smaller than what I work with. I actually don't work with passerines, but the new birdhouse is going to house a bunch of passerines, passerines that will help thrive the passerines and hopefully get people to be more educated about passerine, which birds are actually in their backyard. Yeah. The migration story is incredible. For such a little bird, the way they migrate to just get to and from, I think is a very impressive story. And colors on passerines will knock your socks off. So that's really going to be what the new bird house is going to be like. And again, I work with the bigger birds, but my coworkers that's going to work with the passerines, they're going to do an incredible job. So hats off to them to tell the story of passerines and for National Zoo to exhibit them and help these the species, songbirds, and they can get along and thrive because. Without them, we miss a whole lot. So. Yeah, definitely. So again, our birdhouse is currently closed for this big renovation to focus on those smaller migratory birds that we, all of us in the continental United States can see in our backyards as they migrate from North yeah. America um, off into South or Central America. That's incredible. But you mentioned you work mostly with these larger birds, you mentioned this word, this word ratite, and I want to know from our audience, if anyone knows the word ratite and what type of bird that is, you can give some examples in the chat. Let's see if anyone knows. We've actually given a couple hints already. Let's see, the oh. Burke family had a good guess. Yeah. Alex and Andrew guessed Rhea was on the screen. Abby guessed ostrich. 
Oh, wow. Okay. Bird family said, is it a bird that can't fly? Gwen. Oh, <laughs> somebody asked, do they eat rats? So <laughs> <laughs> That's a good guess. There's a joke like, there somewhere. And just when you thought you heard them all. I know. Um, Gwen, why don't you tell us what a rat tight is? <laughs> rat tight is... <laughs> Most of the answers were spot on. Yeah. They are large birds that cannot fly. Um, there are smaller ones, but like we have, we exhibit, we did have emus, we have an ostrich, cassowary. Um, oh, you see the kiwi, not a large bird, but also cannot fly. Yeah. No, they do not eat rats, <laughs> but they all have that one common thing, they do not fly. Wow. That's... I think we all learned a new vocabulary word today. Do you have a favorite rat type that you've worked with? So I have to go Rias. I have to go Rias for my favorite. Why? They're all incredible. They're cute. Look how cute Rias are. Rias are adorable. They're curious. We've been exhibiting them since I've been a zookeeper. They're very, what I would deem low maintenance. Yeah, they have poop. But as far as their maintenance daily, it's very low maintenance compared to some of the other birds. Yeah. They're curious. And I mean, come on, they're cute. Look at them. <laughs> uh, Serena in our chat says she loves kiwis. Um, Emily wanted to know what do Rias eat? So our rat types eat a rat type pellet. They're pretty much herbivores. They're not oh. big into meat. So in this picture, this bird has grass, but normally in any of our exhibits, we don't give them grass because they just constantly will eat it. They're herbivores. Yeah. So they get a rat type pellet, and again, it's called rat tight. And we just keep that in a bucket so they always have it and water. Rhea is like to drink a lot of water. So. Yeah. And yeah. Robert, I think, maybe noticed how long and skinny the Rhea's legs are. Are they fast runners? Rhea's can run really fast. They can take off, they do what we call dart running, which is one of the things that we want to avoid when we enter an exhibit. You don't want to spook them. They take off running and we want to keep that from being, they pretty much run. And it's like the brain's trying to tell the legs where to run. It's kind of a, we're gonna take off first. So they're gonna run like crazy, take off. They can't fly. So if you can't fly, you better be able to run fast. Yeah, so funny. Um, yeah, Sarita said they're really cute. I absolutely agree. I agree. Look at that face. <laughs> they're cute. This is just so cool that you get to work with such a vast array of different species of birds and like they all have these different requirements and it just makes me think how much knowledge you've accumulated over your career. And so going back to our first question, we asked our audience, you know, what areas of STEAM, science, technology, engineering, art, and math that you use in your work? Can you give us some examples of how you use these different things? You have to use all of those as being a zookeeper. You have to come in with the, for me, for the STEAM part of it, you do have to kind of know the birds, know the environment. You need the artistry of making an exhibit fit the birds' needs. Like we wouldn't start planting a bunch of grassies where Rias and Charlie just eat it. Yeah. Um, oh, look at this picture. So yeah, I think you have to use all your senses or everything to be a zookeeper. There's no way you can do it without it. I luckily, when I started, I came into a bunch of experienced people that taught me so much so fast. That helped me get to where I am and then evolving into where zookeeping is now with birds. Yeah, you have to use steam. You have to have good training on everything you do as far as the birds go. Yeah, I know. And so much observations, you know, mm -hmm. you're made, you're the first people who are making observations about the the health and wellness of your animals engineering exhibits for them you know you wouldn't the Rhea who can't fly you probably wouldn't put their nest all the way at the top of their exhibit because they have no way of getting up there so just knowing that basic information about our animals can then allow you to provide a life for them that's incredible so so many things about making observations and making observations is such an easy way for everyone watching to go out and make connections with wildlife and wild places. Bird watching, just by watching birds, you can really develop a love for them. Oh, okay. um, Gwen, did you always want to be a bird keeper? Not really. <laughs> 
I, birds were probably not on my high list of being a bird keeper. What but did the, you originally want to be? I really just wanted to come to a zoo and literally play with animals. Most people probably think we come and it's animals. We get to play with them and hold them. And it's so not that. You literally want to preserve the life of that species, make sure they're healthy, make sure they're getting everything they need. So birds were not my first choice. I kind of fell in love with ducks. Oh. Ducks are incredible. Yeah. Yeah. And the patterns, nothing for me between the two places that I work and looking at the colors on birds and how smart I realized that they were, that you didn't think they were and how hard it was to make sure that their needs were met. I took birds for granted. Yeah. But again, I was surrounded by so much experience with the keepers that I got to work with and the knowledge that I learned from them and watching birds figure out things and just for me there's nothing prettier than some of the birds and some of the ducks will take your breath away when I you see that. I mean just, birds and there's just so many species of them and I mean look at them truly I mean this picture of this cory buster chick it almost looks like a clouded leopard pattern but on a bird and I think that's so incredible yes so you mentioned that you didn't originally want to be a bird keeper or necessarily work in a zoo so how did you find yourself here 30 years later as a birdhouse keeper? So kind of thought most of this webinar would be my story, which would probably be long, but I'm going to see if I can make it as short as possible. So I was a single mom back eons ago, early 90s, and I literally had given up on trying to find a job between going to school and raising my kid and dealing with everything else that comes with that. You just want to give up. Child care was so expensive for my kid. Everything I made in a check pretty much went to child care. So my mom, you know, moms do what they do. I'm sure dads do as well. Wanted to see me do better. Wanted me to do what she knew I could be. And she found this program for me that had to, you go to school and they teach you how to get back in the workforce. They help you with child care. They helped me with everything. There was no reason to not go and participate in this program. The one, they had contracts with different places, um, the equestrian center, a funeral home. And I had to, all, me and the young ladies that were there, I already had like two years of college on my belt, but life was just getting harder and harder. National Zoo saved my life. The program did not have a contract with National Zoo, so I initiated one. They said, if you can initiate one with National Zoo, we'll honor the same thing. We'll get you the voucher for your kid. There's no reason for me not to go. So, so I felt like National Zoo literally saved my life back then. So you were in this college program designed mm -hmm. to help get you your foot in the door with these internship programs, but there wasn't an existing program at the zoo. You started the internship program at the zoo. I started that program. I'm like, you know, my dad, my rock always would be my rock. He's 96 years old and bless his heart. He's my guy. So they said I came to the zoo and upper management then was totally different. And I said, hey, I just need to do 40 hours. And if you guys can give me 40 hours, then I can get the benefits from my program. And I just have to come to the zoo, have fun, play with animals. So did they just had to do a little wordsmithing from volunteer to intern? Yeah. Didn't matter as long as I was doing 40 hours. And again, came to work with people who this was their job, working with animals. And I learned so much. I came to work, work with birds, learned a lot, just enjoyed it. It was so much fun. And I found life again. So National Zoo, when I say save my life, it really saved my life. And I got to do a job I didn't even know exists, work with animals for money, unheard of. So. I think, and again, another very common theme in this program is most of the staff and these different jobs I've been highlighting over the last school year, people didn't know that these jobs existed. Um, and there's such different jobs in the zoo field you know being a zookeeper is one of them and you didn't even know that was possible that was, no that's that's amazing um and I'm gonna be launching just another poll here in a second okay. um for our audience members but to have created the first internship at the National Zoo over 31 years ago and now being a senior birdhouse keeper, what a journey you've had, this incredible supportive internship program you participated in, 
yes. breaking all the barriers. And I want to see from the audience, what are some ways that they think that zoos have changed over the years, over the last 30 years? Tons of ways, obviously, like any field is changing, but maybe exhibit spaces, staff diversity, animal diversity, safety measures have changed. And if you have any other ideas of things that have probably changed in zoos over the last 30 years, put it in the chat. I'd love to hear from you all. Because I imagine a lot has changed and you've watched a lot change and yeah. initiated a lot of things changing, I'm sure. I did. Give folks another few seconds. So don't forget to put those ideas in the chat if you think of other things. <laughs> yeah, Maria said, I think everything has changed, just about. Oh, Anthony, that's a great guess. Animal medicine, yeah. yeah the types of, of food, yeah. Oh, um, Aramis said, people have started to be more kind to animals. That was a great guess. Animal yeah. respect, Abby said. All right, I'm going to leave you another three seconds on this poll in three, two, and one. <laughs> Let's see, I shared these results. And yeah, uh, number one said animal diversity and safety measures, but really folks guessed all of the above. What are some things that you've noticed change over the last 30 years, Gwen? Wow. Um, exhibit space for sure. Like I said, my hyena story, it resonates with me. Yeah. Like we running down to go see the hyena and my dad, you know, he's like, well, you know, they're going to build this new birdhouse soon. And I'm like, I don't want to see no birds. <laughs> they were like really building the national aviary. And ironically, I ended up working in there. But my, you know, it's just ironic that I said that to my father and look where I work now. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Famous last but, words, right? <laughs> yeah, but to see the exhibits, all these birds crowded in one exhibit, hyenas that didn't laugh, it felt like animals were put on exhibit just for the hours that the zoo was open. Had no idea that probably those animals were not as happy, were not enriched, were not getting any STEM program activity, weren't doing anything. So as a young person and then starting, and then like I said, coming to work with the people that I work with and learning that there were so many things you can do to help those animals thrive, be healthier, Give them the right diet. Diets have changed since I've been here. Exhibits definitely have changed. Species sizes, spaces have changed. Staff diversity for sure has changed. We need, you know, a lot more diversity and work. But National Zoo, I think, is doing a good job of trying to make that work. I'm a prime example of that. They did not have to take me in with what I was bringing to the table. And it's so hard to be a zookeeper now. And somebody gave me a chance. Yeah. So. I want to give back. I want to give chances to people so that they can experience what I experienced with National Zoo. Yeah. You know, there are days when I come to work and my head wants to explode because you've had a stressful day or it's a little bit different. But I go home and I think about how I got here and the chances that this place gave me. Hey, it was worth it yeah. for me to be with who I am, what I've done. I'm proud of myself. If nobody else is, I am. My daughter is. I feel like I've helped a lot of people through internship programs, through volunteer programs. Still keep in touch with a lot of those kids from, oh God, see how I've aged in these pictures from like years ago. And I still keep in, but it makes, it warms my heart and it makes me feel good about what I'm doing and a chance to give back to a place that, again, I may say it a million times on this webinar, has given me so much. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Gwen, you are, from when I was a keeper, a, a staple keeper in my yeah. professional career, and uh, it's been just wonderful working with you. Um, so, but you did mention a few things that aren't animal related that you've actually really enjoyed in your career, which is yes. mentorship. You know, you just told us this incredible story of how you found this field and got into this field and your passion for birds. Yeah. And here in this photo is you mentoring interns. We saw a previous photo, you mentoring yeah. volunteers and um, other uh, interns and in high school programs and such of, and this is you giving back and teaching the next generation of zookeepers. Yeah. Now, everyone watching, I want you to send me a big thumbs up or a heart if zookeeping is a field that you might wanna follow one day. <laughs> Let's get those going. Um, but you mentioned some other things about how the zoo has really changed. Again, you you talked about this hyena story of yes, it seemed to have been this shift from focusing on 
just exhibiting animals to exhibit the animals, but now we're changing the focus to conservation. What yeah. can we do as an institution or individually to help save the species that we are exhibiting, which is why we are redoing the birdhouse. You can see here's this great before and what will be an after photo here. It's no longer just about exhibiting birds, but to tell the story of bird migration so yeah. that everyone who has these migrating birds in their backyard can help save them. That's incredible. What else have you seen change over the last 30 years of your career? Like, well, like when I started back way back in, and the exhibits changed for making exhibits bigger, staff changed. I was, pro I am probably one of maybe four or five African-American zookeepers at National Zoo. Yeah. I started, you walk around and of course you see, a, not to offend anybody, a bunch of young white people. Yeah. But I never felt that it was because of anything horrible, racism or anything. I just thought that there wasn't a lot of African-Americans or brown babies that understood that this was a job. And not just zookeeping. There's engineers, there's horticulture people, there's nutritionists, so many fields in the zoo. And at that point, I'm like, okay, what can I do to help bring people of color in the way I got in? So I have a niece that was a school teacher this is where I met you, Shelly, hitting you up for tours at the day before they were coming. <laughs> Give these kids tours. And I'm like, we got to do it. And I knew I could count on a lot of wonderful people to say, yes, I can give a tour to these people just to introduce these kids to the zoo. I had my dad. Yeah. A lot of people did not have my dad. That's unfortunate because he's that animal person. Mm -hmm. I get my love of animals from my father. So we lived in the zoo and I had to do something to give back, to see if I can get kids in my neighborhood to come in and look at the zoo. So we did those tours. And every time I've called you or any other unit, you guys would just, yes, we'll do it. So yeah. that was always awesome. I did that for a few years. That's that great. niece is now the principal of her school. So That's <laughs> we no longer do the tours, but yeah, I think we touched a lot of lives during those tours and I had great zoo support doing it. Great. And really, I mean, you are now the spark and this inspiration like your dad was for you. You are yeah. the spark and inspiration for all of those students watching today who are like, I think I wanna be a zookeeper. Like you can what? be a zookeeper. You too can be a zookeeper. You just yeah. Have to sit. yeah. God, Gwen, this has been really, really incredible. And your, your passion for wildlife in general, but especially birds really comes through. I mean, talking about the, how beautiful birds are and their colors. Yeah. Does yeah. this passion carry over into your home life as well? Do you have any birds back home? I do. And it's like being a zookeeper back when we used to get a lot of calls. You know, part of my, one of my conservation things is uh, animal trapping, stealing, buying animals that nobody should own. That's a story in itself that could probably take hours to tell, but I think it's a conservation message that needs to be told. Right. I have a parrot at my house. I've had three or four parrots through the years that were purchased by people, not really understanding when you purchase an animal like this, this is gonna be, oh. <laughs> so this is JJ. He's my parrot that I have at home now that belongs to somebody who probably should have never owned this bird. These birds are smart. They want and need a lot of enrichment. The pet trade in general, to smuggle these birds in for people to take parrots without understanding what you're getting into. You're talking about an animal that's gonna live a long time. You're talking about an animal that can be, look at the bill on this thing. He tears up my doors if he gets out, he'll tear up wood. He loved my daughter, so they would literally tear up her door to get to her. That story needs to be told. Please don't pet as a bird if you don't want to put the time in. So I didn't buy any parrot. Any parrot I had was a parrot that somebody wanted to put on exhibit at the zoo. Yeah. You can't take everybody's parrot. So to help with that, I think the story needs to be told about not purchasing these animals. If you want to see them, then go somewhere where they're on exhibit. Yeah. Don't buy them. Big conservation story for me. The Thanks. little guy with the turkey hat, I'll take him anytime. <laughs> <laughs> Just to be clear, JJ, your pet bird is the one on the left. <laughs> and Chaz is a little dude. He belongs to me. We're not going to worry about trading him. I'll keep him. Oh, no. <laughs> but thank you really, Gwen, for sharing that message. It's 
pet trade, responsible pet ownership is yeah. such an easy conservation action that we can all do. Research the pet that you're interested in. Make sure that yeah. their lifestyle and requirements fit yours. You know, if you didn't know that a parrot was going to live that long, you might not get a, a now. Gwen has this awesome pair that she gets to take care of. Yeah. That's just been great. Gwen, we have reached our 45 minutes, and I know some folks might need to fly to their next class, but I am going to launch our closing polls, but do stick around if you have the time, because we are going to jump right into our Q&A here, and we have so many great questions uh, for you, Gwen. Um, okay. I'm going to ask you some of this. So I went ahead and launched that closing poll, but let's jump right in. First and most important question, is being a zookeeper fun? Oh, it's the best job ever. It's like every day you expect it's going to be different. You wake up with a headache, not want to come to work. I can picture the birds that I have to come. They depend on me to come. I depend on them to make me smile. It's a fun job. It's not a job at all. You just have to come to work and take care of animals, which you want to do anyway. You, like every job has its challenges, but it's always some bird or something that's going to make you smile before you come home. I'm a zookeeper. I work with animals, so. And they pay me for it. So like, <laughs> what could be better? Hey, good job. Um, we had another question here. Do zookeepers or staff ever go into the field or into the wild to study the animals that you work with here at the zoo? Some keepers do. Like if you get a trip to go, I say you like primates and you get to go out and study primates in the wild. Smithsonian, the Smithsonian, they, you can do that. This is a great place to come in and continue co your career, work with animals, take trips to go out and look at the animals that you love to do. I wouldn't want necessarily go out and look at apes, but that opportunity is there. So yeah. for people who enjoy that kind of thing, this is a place to be to make that happen. So yes, people do get to go out and feel and study their animals that they love. Fantastic. Uh, Miss Pearson's class wants to know, how do you keep the birds calm when they're getting checked by the veterinarian, like we saw in some of those photos? Again, so enrichment would help. It probably will not get to where I would like to see it in my career time, but we do like a simple way of calming down some birds is just to cover their eyes. If they can't see it coming, they kind of don't want to expect the horrible. We can cover their eyes, they're calm them down. We can continue to give them their food that they like to keep them calm and keep them stable. We like to, if it's noisy, we'll shut all the noise off. We'll quiet it, make it where they're in their one area that they love, make it safe, make it quiet, keep them safe because it's all about them first. And by learning them and using all of the program that you know, you try to make that a calm experience. Nobody likes getting an exam. I don't like getting an exam. There's nothing they can give me to calm me down. I just have to be a big girl and do it. Yeah. But if they cover my eyes, that may work. I don't <laughs> Yeah, maybe. Hey, I should but try. They, get a, they get a treat at the end of the exam, right? Yeah. Like we often get a lollipop, a lollipop at the end of a shot. They might yeah. get their favorite treats, right? <laughs> That's awesome. Um, James wanted to know if you've worked with any birds of prey, like eagles. Yes, we did have pair of bald eagles. We had row of owls. So that was early in my career. So I was more getting trained and watching those keepers do it. But yeah, you get a lot of respect. I mean, everybody respects an eagle. It's a bald eagle, yeah. but you don't respect them until you see the talents that they have and what they could do to you. So I have worked with them, but I was more or less a younger keeper. So I didn't get the hands on with them, but I've seen it pretty impressive. Yeah. That's great. Oh, Anthony had a really interesting question. Okay. Has having a parrot helped you in your career or maybe the opposite of your career has helped you as a parrot owner? So working with parrots definitely helped me with my guys at home. You learn what you learn at the zoo and I apply it at home. I knew that on the parrot, it was going to be a lot of enrichment, a yeah. lot of toys, very expensive. You can make toys, but you also learn that enrichment could be something as simple as a toilet paper roll with paper towels stuffed in it or shredded paper. Just yeah. have to be something daily to keep them enriched. You cannot just sit this animal in a cage and expect it to thrive. That's no way to treat an animal. So I did take what I learned at zoo and apply it to my stuff at home for sure. That's Definitely cool. helps. 
Um, this is a two part question. What okay. is the best part about being a zookeeper and the hardest part about being a zookeeper? The best part is you feel good about what you're doing. You know, I don't like to toot my own horn and that's a lie. I'll toot my horn all the time. You know that you're, you're it, you're the voice, you're the eyes, you're the person that's gonna help that animal do well, be better. And you have to pride yourself on that. And I definitely do pride myself on that. And my coworkers around me, we support each other with questions and I can go to some of my younger coworkers, to my older coworkers, to my coworkers that are not even in the same area with me right now. And it's just, I love that support and growth and knowledge from people. So yeah, I'd love having that experience and taking that with me. So I'm gonna get off the beaten path with the questions, but you get where I'm going. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. absolutely. Great. Um, Sophie had a question about um, endangered birds. Um, we do some breeding here at the National Zoo. Do we ever release any of those birds we've bred here into the wild? So we haven't released them into the wild, but with this program and with the new birdhouse, how, we don't know how far we're gonna go. We like migratory birds tell a story. I mean, and for people to recognize what they have right in their backyard. And if National Zoo's new birdhouse do what we hope it's gonna do, that then who knows? I can't say for sure. And I might not be a zookeeper when it, that point comes, but yeah, aim high, go for doing everything to give back. Why not? Um, great. And um, Aramis asked again, why you chose to be a zookeeper. You talked about your passion for, for wildlife that you got from your parents. Yeah. Um, so when you finished that internship, what made you decide like after that internship, you said, yes, this is for me. So in that school, that program that I went to, I had to take this test. I think it was the after two test where you take the test and you answer all these questions and it spits out these careers that may be suited for you based on your answers. Kept giving me plants and animals, plants and animals. I'm like, no. So I even tried to answer the questions differently. <laughs> it still come up, plants and animals, plants and animals. I'm like, okay, this is something I need to do. So I had no idea that I could be a zookeeper. So the program I went through was awesome. National Zoo was awesome. I get to, working with plants was probably not gonna be my thing. That was more of a hobby. But animals, yeah, from all the puppies that you drag home when you're a kid and all the stuff you find and you say, oh, my dad though, he's like, what are we gonna do with it? And I said, you gotta tell mom, that's your job. <laughs> but not knowing that he was that animal person, I could always go to him with all the puppies that follow you home, you know, they follow you home. Yeah. And I said, what, what are we gonna do with it? And he said, I don't know, what are we gonna tell your mom? And I said, that's your job. <laughs> but he was always there for me. So back then when stray dogs were everywhere, mm. people have gotten really smart with their animals now, thank God. I had. I had no dog that we paid for. I dragged home every dog that we could find. So to take that test and for it to say that, yeah. and I go back in my head, my child, I'm like, yeah, you got to do that. You got to work with it. Yeah. So, so this passion for wildlife has always been in you, even you always. Know, your mm -hmm. program, that aptitude test was like, yep, you're going to work with animals and plants. And even when you tried to lie on it, it said, yeah. yep, you're going to work with animals and plants. And, and you that weird, you that weird kid and your dad's helping you string up wrap up a little sparrow's wing and I'm like, oh, is he gonna live? I mean, he's my dad. He's not gonna tell me it's gonna die, but yeah. we had to do it. And the, yeah. now I do that same thing. I get to relive my childhood again, but again, I get paid for it now. Yeah. So, <laughs> it's great. The dream. Yeah. Um, we had a question about, mm -hmm. specifically about JJ or Macaw. Does he have a favorite enrichment piece or toy that he likes to play with? Yeah, my name. So I buy him a lot of toys, but I've learned from being a zookeeper, the things that you can make. I think I touched on that earlier. And you get a parrot and you want to talk. You want to hear him say your name. Yeah. Your so I kept every day, say Gwen, say Gwen, say Gwen. And he looked at me like, you know, what's the importance of saying Gwen until he starts saying it? First time is cute. A hundred times later, you're over it. You're done with it. But now he, it, 
I'm mean, his enrichment toy. He'll keep yeah. calling me. He does the same thing with my dogs, though. He calls okay. your dogs' names, too. Oh, yeah. He whistles. They'll come right into the cage. They fall for it every time. So it sounds like your macaw is giving enrichment for your dogs also. He loves it. These are very smart animals. The dogs haven't caught on. Matter of fact, I don't catch on all the time either. I literally turn around and say, what, what? What are you screaming at? Because he's continuing to call my name, so. Yeah, that's fantastic. Oh, we have just got a great question in. Okay. If you, let's see who this is from, from Buddha. If you could restart your career, would you do anything different? I think if I could restart my career, if I knew that there was such a job that you get paid for working at animals. So like when we were younger and you walk around this park, you didn't see zookeepers. That was not a thing. Zookeepers were, you knew they were there, but they were not seen when you walk around the zoo. My dad said, you know, there was a lot of African-American zookeepers when white people, again, no offense to white people, did not want to do the poop scooping job. That was just kind of unheard of. So people who needed a job, you do anything for a job. So you literally, animals were pushed out on exhibit, zookeepers were not seen. All of that's changed now. They want you to be out front, be educators to the public, answer the questions, be seen. So would I take a different path? Probably, I probably would just went right into biology, trying to be the best zookeeper I could have be from jump instead of, not that getting the experience was awesome, but just to start from jump. This is what I want to do. Yeah. I thought I wanted to be a vet, but me and blood, that's not a thing. But, <laughs> to, be a, yeah. <laughs> but to just be a zookeeper, yeah. I would have probably started my career out like that instead of making some of the other choices that I thought I wanted to do. Yeah. Just had no idea that was such a job as zookeeping. But. Yeah. And again, the whole purpose of the series is that these jobs exist out there. And jobs exist. Like you said, if you had known that this was an available job to you, you know, you would know that this is what I want to go to school for and the classes you need to take. Um, That's fantastic. Um, I have one more question for you. Um, We are running out of time, but we have gotten so many great questions. Do you consider zookeeping hard? You've talked about your passion and how fun it is, but is it hard? What parts of it are hard? It can be hard. I mean, obviously we work with stuff that's alive. There will be things that leave you. Yeah. You pretty much are told, not told, you kind of don't want to be that attached to the animals, but you can't. You cannot not be attached to the animals. You come to work, you give some of them names, whether they respond to them like your dog, no. But you know it and you pass it on. We have names for a lot of our animals and you you love them. I don't think you could do this job if you didn't. It takes a big part of caring for the animals and you give your all. No, I would not go to work and choose an animal over my grandsons or my daughter for God's sakes, but these animals are pretty close. And zookeepers now, we got animals living 30, 40 years. I mean, that says a lot. That yeah. means somebody's doing their job. All these entities that make up the zoo, the vets, the nutritionists, the people that trim the grasses, all of that coming together, not hiding zookeepers, pushing animals out. All that comes together to have animals living. Good God. When I started, they had animals that were at National since 78. <laughs> I wow. think it speaks a lot about how zoos have changed. It's not put the hyena out, it dies, go out and get another one. No, the one you have, you make that one live longer. Yeah. You give it what it needs. You give it vet care. You give it the food it needs, the enrichment it needs. That animal lives longer. You're not going out in the wild and you're snatching animals. So much have changed yeah. with zoos. And it takes everything, the scientists, the I mean, I can sit here all day, but I do, you know, I am a zookeeper. I got yes. stuff. To do, we, we got animals to clean and poop, uh, animals to, to clean, clean up. And it's like, up, right? <laughs> when people say you're a poop, sco- poop scooper, I'm like, you have no idea what it takes to be a right. zookeeper. Yeah. And that is, a, it, t- it doesn't take us that long to clean up the poop. Use a power nozzle. I love a power oh, yeah. nozzle. You pop the poop off from, or you just pick it up. 
that is not even being a zookeeper. Being a zookeeper is all of those things and yeah. having all of those people around you to make that happen. It's like yeah. one zoo, you know, and I'm going to actually get to where I believe that is a real thing. I'm getting ready to retire soon, but that it takes all of these people to make these animals live longer and educate people and bring diversity to the park. Yeah. This has been incredible. I can't express enough thanks to you for joining us for our final unusual careers for the school year, okay. for closing out the Smithsonian celebration of Black Birders Week, which has just been so important. Can you leave us with any final words of advice for anyone watching who might want to pursue zookeeping in their future? I would say do it. If you want to be a zookeeper, definitely do it. It is the best job that I could have ever not imagined myself doing. And my story, I love my story. Nobody should talk about themselves as much as I do. But if you ask me about my story, you're gonna have to listen. So yeah, you should be a zookeeper, wanna be a zookeeper. If you like animals, if you like conservation, if you have a message, or if you just wanna trim the grass in an animal exhibit, that's all helping. Yeah. Learn more about enrichment. I wish that I had enrichment back then, but I had experience back then. So one hand washed the other. I was around a lot of great people. So for me, that was enriching and that helped me to learn and be better at what I'm doing. And I wanted to give back for every year that I've been at the zoo, give something back, but I had to support a national zoo. So I well, can't say enough about it. You have given me so much support and knowledge in my own career. So yeah. it is, I can speak for myself that you are absolutely giving back. Gwen, thank you again for joining us today. You're welcome. Uh, Thanks for having me. I will see you later. And thank you to everybody else for joining us today. We hope that you will check out all of the amazing um, resources available from Black Birders Week. Look for that link in the chat. Additionally, we would love your feedback on today's program. You will see a survey pop up in your um, web browser when we close the webinar. So educators, if you wouldn't mind taking just a few minutes to fill that out. As I mentioned, this is the last installment of Unusual Careers for the school year. So be sure to catch up on all previous episodes on our YouTube playlist. And on behalf of the Smithsonian's National Zoo and Conservation Biology Institute, we hope you have a wild day.